Permaculture in Action is this new class model that Dylan Riles Hamilton and I came up with last year that provides affordable, hands-on permaculture education that's in-depth and helps to establish permaculture demonstration sites around the Asheville area. We want to, to really have it be teaching permaculture rather than just building a pond or building a duck run or doing mushroom logs. So the landowners who are eligible are those for whom we've done permaculture master plans already. So they have a design that we can teach from the design and show the students why we made all the choices that we made. One of the beautiful things about permaculture, it's an ethically based design system. So it says this is why we do all of this. The three ethics of permaculture are, are care for the earth, taking care of people, and sharing the surplus. The way the model works financially is that we have two sources of payment. The landowners are paying in to have projects done and the students are paying in for their tuition and so it reduces the cost for both. So this behind me is what we call our, our milpa and this is a pretty amazing story. It's on a street corner here. Uh, there used to be a house here that got torn down many years ago and then it was just a a trash pile where everyone threw all of their beer cans and stuff and then it got grown up in kudzu and burdock. And Zev Friedman, one of the founders of Permaculture in Action, and his apprentices and I last year um, cleared the kudzu. And kudzu is a really incredible plant. It's this invasive plant from Japan, but it's also a nitrogen fixer. It's been improving the soil here for over 20 years, so we found the soil to be incredible. This year, when it was time to plant again, we made it part of the Permaculture in Action uh, class because we had learned a lot and there were some great teaching opportunities there as well as the desire to grow even more food more effectively. There were a couple of design challenges here, one of which is that although part of it is flat, part of it gets pretty slopey, so we wanted to make sure and preserve soil and prevent erosion, and, and we also really wanted to catch and store water in the landscape so we could use it for irrigation at the times that it's needed. This this whole design is something that, that I call honeycomb milpa, which is a Guatemalan word for this polyculture of annual crops that includes corn, beans, and squash, but also other plants. We have a, a swale pond. It's a long, skinny, kind of snake-shaped pond. We put the swale pond at the highest elevation possible so that it would store the water high in the landscape and we could use gravity-fed uh, siphon irrigation for getting the water down to the rest of the milpa. That pond just fills from the rainwater that hits it as well as from the roof of Michelle's house. Then we use swales, contoured swales, throughout the milpa, which are uh, their shallow trenches that are on the contour so that when we fill them with water, it floods down into the beds below them and irrigates those beds. And then the planting strategy is a, a mix of up to about 13 or 15 different plants that all have different functions in this little annual cultivated ecosystem that we have here as the milpa. And another fundamental part of it is the addition of charcoal to the soil crushed charcoal mixed with compost, which is known as biochar in the conventional organic movement. That's a big part of uh, allowing the soil to retain moisture and nutrients for all those plants to uptake. And then the plants themselves support each other in all kinds of myriad ways, from the beans pulling nitrogen into the soil to feed to the corn, to the cleomies attracting insect pollinators to the edges, which then pollinate the squash. And there are all kinds of other interactions that go on like that, so the whole thing is kind of a, a living, connected food web. Another really amazing piece of what has happened here is, is how Michelle Smith, the property owner, has been forced into creativity by the circumstances, meaning she doesn't have a lot of money, and so she's had to really reach out to many different parts of the community to ask for support in accomplishing this thing. I was able to get a great deal of help in installing some really fundamental features. And so what we accomplished here with the Permaculture in Action class and other things on her property, some of those were trade with us, with the class where she, um, she did work for us and we came and did things on the property. With the people that took, we, I took the class with, you know, by in the beginning of the class we didn't know each other very well. By the end of the class we were just so connected to each other and are still connected to each other. And it's shown us how not having much money will actually make a, a community in a much more real way. Well, I really wanted to have a design that would allow me to grow much more food, to have a productive yard instead of just an ornamental yard. At Chaz Jansen, it's a much different type of, of 
property very small, less than an eighth of an acre. What that involved was it was a kind of a big yard makeover. We started out with his front yard being a lawn, and by the end of the day, there was, there was no lawn visible. The whole thing is sheet mulched, which is a, a technique where we use compost, then cardboard, then mulch to smother the grass and establish a planting bed for trees and shrubs. And then another pivotal component of his design and what we accomplished during the workday was dealing with the water on the property. He had a cistern already installed on the corner of his house catching water off the roof, but it was just overflowing and creating erosion problems. And also when it rained, water was washing over the front yard and creating a gully towards the corner of the yard. We said, well, let's take that water from the cistern and overflow it into a small pond, put a bridge over the pond so it's this nice entryway towards the house, and then create a recirculation system where the water will be pumped from the pond up to a stone creek bed and constantly run, so there'll be constantly running water in the landscape. And then that water from that pond now is piped into a series of what we call hidden infiltration swales. They're contoured swales, again, like the ones here at the Milpa. In this case, we're trying to get the water to percolate into the soil. So they're deep swales that are dug and filled with wood chips. So when the water from the pond overflows through their pipe into the swale, the water then sits in that swale and percolates into the soil to be used by the roots of the trees and shrubs growing around it. We also did an installation of a dry stack stone wall, which is a common low-tech um, method for putting up retaining walls, which is really beautiful. It just requires more skill than using mortar because you have to use gravity and the rocks fitting together to get the stones to stay in place over time rather than cement, but it actually lasts longer than cement because it doesn't trap the water behind the wall and freeze and thaw during the winter. And finally, we completed probably the most ambitious herb spiral in western North Carolina. It's this beautiful, large, 16-foot diameter herb spiral. Uh, an herb spiral is kind of a permaculture trademark, an old thing that, that Bill Mollison invented. And it's basically a way of creating more planting space and microclimates by mounding soil up and then spiraling a stone retaining wall into that mound. So it's like a mountain with a ascending path of stone. And we created one of those with the soil that we dug out of the pond as well as that we dug out of the bank to build a retaining wall. We used all that soil on site to build the herb spiral. And it was so wonderful to be able to work with Dev uh, Friedman and Dylan Riles Hamilton, having their class come on here and in this little yard like 22 people were digging and wielding other tools and it was an amazing transformation. Hands down the, the main thing that we hope students to leave this class with is an infectious sense of hope and possibility. We want people to leave inspired. The second thing is to leave with enough skills and confidence to actually engage permaculture projects on their own on whatever scale and of whatever type. Another important goal was for students to be able to talk themselves about what permaculture is and what they're doing, what they've learned when they leave. And then finally, we, we want students to have a grasp of the, of the science and the evidence behind all of these techniques and the need for this whole systems design thinking so that they can really uh, portray it in a persuasive way when they go out into the world.